He was born and raised here in St. Paul, where the playgrounds are hotbeds for baseball. As a youngster, Paul Molitor developed a deep passion for the game, and he had a gift to play it well on the neighborhood tour. Linwood, Oxford, Creighton, and Dunning Four. Those were the fields for a dreamer, and as Molitor grew, so did a legend. Twice an All-American at the University of Minnesota, the kid from the capital city hit the major league stage in 1978 and never stopped running. 39 in a row. How about that? That is something. In Milwaukee, he chased DiMaggio. In Toronto, he chased a championship. And finally, the journey brought him home for the moment and the milestone that stamped his ticket to Cooperstown. The invitation to join the Immortals of the game arrived early this year when Molitor became a first ballot selection to Baseball's Hall of Fame. His story is next as St. Paul to the Hall begins now on Fox Sports Net. Just west of downtown St. Paul, the tree lines of Summit Avenue are both a border and the centerpiece of Crocus Hill. Born in August of 1956, Paul Molitor grew up here, one of eight children. His family settled first on Grand Avenue. The alley out back was a magnet for the neighborhood kids and the neighborhood games. Your leisure time, so to speak, uh, as a youngster, it, it, it might evolved around baseball. Right. In his formative years, Paul's devotion to the game was fueled in part by the Minnesota Twins, a major league newcomer in Bloomington. Here's the windup. Way back when, when we used to, you know, not get a chance to see that many games on television, there was a lot of nights sitting there doing your math homework and having the radio on in the background and keeping speed with how the club was doing. And that's kind of where, you know, the dream was early, but it, it inspired the dream to continue. In Harmon Killebrew, the Twins had a Hall of Famer in the making, the Molitor. Another favorite was Bob Allison. Bob was kind of more of the, uh, the dog-eat-dog -dog kind of player. He was tall, but he played an aggressive game, both defensively, leaving his feet, made the famous catch in the World Series against the Dodgers back in 65, and just had an aggressive style about him. Molitor had heroes at Met Stadium and a player to watch in his own backyard. At the time when, when Paul played, this was called Dunning Four. It is just west of St. Paul Central High School. Dave Winfield lived right up the block, probably 70, 80 long steps. And Paul lived the same proximity, only about seven blocks south. He was playing in the same playgrounds uh, that I was, but naturally in the upper levels. But every once in a while, you'd catch a glimpse of Big Dave strolling around the playground. And he had a presence even back then as a junior in high school. In a golden era for St. Paul baseball, Molitor was five years younger than Winfield, one year behind Jack Morris of Highland Park, and Molly was already a playground star in his own right. As early as fifth grade at St. Luke's Elementary School, Paul's talent caught the eye of his Phi Ed teacher, Dennis Denning. He told me, he said, hey, Wes, he said, I had a kid in Phi Ed. He's going to go all the way. And I said, you he said he's going to be in the major leagues. He can run, he can throw, he can hit, and he can field. He was just a little guy that had the high energy, and uh, you could tell right away that he had baseball skills. I'm talking about that. When he threw the ball, it was way better than everybody else in the school. When he threw the ball, it was way more accurate than everybody else in the school. He was fast and high energy quickness, and, and just a little cute little guy, you know, that uh, uh, was just uh, boom, 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 you know. That summer, his Linwood team won a championship. He was a year younger than the majority of them, and we were right on this field right here, and uh, somebody was hitting fly balls to the outfield and hit one uh, over his head, and he just dropped one foot, went straight back, and took it in full stride over his shoulder, and I just, my eyes popped out, and waited for him to come back, and I said, what's your name? And a little squeaky voice, Paul Molitor, and I said, well, I remember that name. In 1965, the Molitor family moved to a corner house on Portland Avenue. When Paul was a teenager, the area's Legion team, Addix Brooks, was dominant. Like Winfield, Molly's baseball coach was Billy Peterson. 
I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps and probably was a year or two out when I started coaching Dave. So I had no clue how good Dave Winfield was. When Molitor came along, I had somebody to guide or gauge by. And I knew from the beginning that Paul had that potential to play in the major leagues, or, you know, to go as high as he wanted to go. He'd line us all up on a first baseline, and we'd all run towards the dirt out by shortstop and do head first slides to finish the practice. Uh, the parents didn't really appreciate that as far as having to clean the uniforms on a regular basis, but he made practice fun. Even when he was 14 or 15, he w there was just something about Paul. It's, it's that thing you can't explain to people of why somebody's better. He wasn't the big dominant person physically, but everything he did, he excelled at. Peterson was also the head coach at Creighton High School, where Molitor was a triple threat leading teams to state championships in soccer, basketball, and baseball. I remember his last at bat, he hit a grand slam to win a state championship for us. Uh, happened to be on a 3-0 count. Uh, so I don't know if Bill Peterson was real happy about that, but we were glad he took a swing at it and uh, ended up winning a state championship. Soon after, Paul was drafted for the first time in the 28th round by the St. Louis Cardinals. When the Cardinals drafted me, I was very tempted to take uh, the $4,000 that they offered and put it in the bank and you know see where professional baseball might take me. A pro career was coming, but not before an All-American stop at the University of Minnesota. We'll head to gold country when St. Paul to the Hall continues on Fox Sports Net. He was the greatest uh, player I'd seen in person up close. In 1974, Paul Molitor accepted a partial scholarship to play baseball at the University of Minnesota, where the head coach, Dick Siebert, was a living legend. Siebert's nickname was The Chief. He had long hair and a beard. That was the style in the middle 70s. We all did, and stuck his head in there, and he kind of said hi to The Chief. He says, who's that? He kind of growls at him. He says, it's Paul in a kind of sheepish way. He says, it's Paul Molitor, and he kind of looks at him. He says, well, let me tell you something, Paul. He said, we got a lot tougher rules around here than the Oakland A's, so you better show up with a haircut and that beard off to, uh, by tomorrow, or you won't be on the practice field. In the winter months, practice for the Gophers included hours of dirty work in the U of M Fieldhouse. At the university, we had an indoor facility that wasn't very good. It was dusty, it was a dirt infield, surrounded by netting that we had to uh, stay within because the track was running around the outside of our little playing infield. But we had to be in there from the middle of early in January to the middle of March. So we're talking about 10 weeks in this little dust bowl of practicing, and all you could do was fundamentals. When the Gophers moved outside, Molitor's instincts took over. As his first season began, the freshman tripled in a game at Texas. I looked at the third base coach and I, and I said, I can, see, I can still hold on this guy. And, uh, and George Thomas was going to say, well, if you can make it, go ahead, you know. So I go ahead and take off and, and I got in the dugout and, and Siebert, you know, whose vision was starting to fail him at the time, said, what happened to you? Did you get picked off a third? And I said, you know, I, I stole home. He goes, well, I sure didn't see it happen, you know. And he was, he was just shocked that a guy, a freshman coming into the university would have the the guts, much less the instinct, to try to try to play like that in one of his first college games. Later in that same game, he stole home again. A remarkable first chapter in a college career that would end in Omaha. In season, Paul was an All-American shortstop twice. In the summer league, his competition featured fellow St. Paul native Jack Morris. The other three teams were all breweries. We had Hams, Schmidt, and Grainbelt. And I played for Hams, and uh, it was a 40-game schedule, so we played every other team, you know, 10 times a piece. And uh, you, you got to know everybody in the league pretty well. And, you know, Paul was the best player on, you know, his University of Minnesota team. In 1977, Molitor led the Gophers to the College World Series. In June of that year, he was drafted by the Brewers, the third player chosen in the first round. The Brewers already had a young star at shortstop. Robin Yount was just 21 when Paul went to Milwaukee to sign his contract. I think we're within, I don't know, maybe a few months of each other age-wise. And he introduced himself and said, it's a pleasure to meet, meet you, Mr. Yount. You could tell even then that uh, he had a way about him that was going to take the game seriously and very professionally. I'll always remember being in a dugout before the game and you know, meeting the likes of Robin and Sal Bando and 
some of the other players, Gorman and, and Sal Bando, you know, tossing Rob in a center fielder's glove and kidding him about getting ready to have to move to the outfield because they had this new draft pick who was coming in as a shortstop. Yount would remain the Brewers' shortstop for years to come. But on opening day of 1978, the starter was the igniter. St. Paul to the Hall runs through Milwaukee next on Fox Sports Net. cold diet pepsi it's the diet cola head to participate in cub foods to win a brand new toyota scion from toyota city scion and diet pepsi go to radio station websites for details bring it check it bring it you're in minnesota now we're gonna chew you up the play is going down you better check it up what you are you are yeah hey, you felt that one huh spring well got it and got right too they'll beat you down and then we're coming for you Introducing IMAX, a half hour of sports news like never before. That void in sports news is now filled. Diverse guests, smart analysis, and challenging questions. It's just my opinion, but I'm right. IMAX with Max Kellerman. Smart, funny, and always opinionated. <laughs> Weeknights on FSN. You're watching FSN North. Mauder and Yount, Yount and Mauder, just over and over. I mean, there were so many great players around them, but there was something so special about them. In 1978, Paul Mauder and Robin Yount began a collaboration that would someday send both players to Cooperstown. Yount, by accident, put Molly in Milwaukee ahead of schedule. Paul had just been sent out. Uh, he was in Major League Camp with the rest of us and I think was, was just sent out uh, to go to AAA. About the time I was coming clean with a story that I'd hurt myself on a motorcycle, I started the season on the DL. I had a pretty good opening series. I remember I hit my first home run in the second game off of Joe Kerrigan. I hit my first hit in the first game and my second at bat off of Mike Flanagan. Still an Andy Etchebarren. Mr. Speedster scored from second on a single. After just 64 games of minor league baseball, Molitor was in the show to stay. A second baseman when Yount returned, and the player who lit the fuse for an offensive powerhouse. The igniter. He was the guy that I hated to see come to the plate in any situation. That nickname fit him perfectly. He would get in and literally ignite our offense. He would start games off with either a walk or uh, get on base somehow. He'd get to second base and he would score. Paul Molitor. You didn't want him coming up in the ninth inning, but sure enough, playing the Brewers, bottom of the ninth, you got the lead. Of course, the leadoff hitter's Molitor, and now you got trouble. There goes the runner, and on the hit and run, Molitor has his second hit of the night. Quick bat, you know, he didn't have a lot of body movement, and therefore it was very difficult for a pitcher to have any kind of game plan against him. You had to hit your spots, and even when you were ahead in the count, you could never feel comfortable because you knew that he could protect the plate and put the ball in play. And when he was going bad, he could bunt. He could do everything that you want in a play. Knew when to take an extra base. Uh, he was a very, very exceptional player right from day one. Molitor's first few years in Milwaukee were highly productive, yet bittersweet. Paul Molitor swings the ball left field, hit deep. The Brew Crew reached the World Series in 1982. Paul had five hits in game one. But a variety of injuries cost him playing time, the equivalent of three full seasons over the course of his career. You know, it was always something crazy. You know, I, I can remember, I think he broke his finger. And as goofy as this sounds, he broke his finger running a lap around the field. And that's the kind of weird stuff that would happen. I think he was running right next to another player whose foot came up as he was running and hit his finger just wrong and broke it. I think in some ways there were some very positive things that came out of those 
uh, injury times. You know, for one, you know, I, I mean, when you're young and you get here and you get established, you know, you never want to take it for granted. But I think the more you play, the more you just expect things to happen. You don't realize how fleeting, fleeting it can be. You're playing a major league game tonight. That's pretty darn good. Gradually, the injuries turned a superb defensive player into a designated hitter. But Molly's bat remained one of the best weapons in baseball. From the time that he got set, his bat could go from position A, boom, to the ball, position B, quicker than anybody I've ever seen. And what that did for Polly was it enabled him to watch the ball longer and be able to decide, take that extra split millisecond to decide if it was a pitch he wanted to attack or not. In 1987, Molitor's compact stroke took a swing at history. Ted Williams once compared Paul to Joe DiMaggio. And for six weeks, Molly made a run at DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. There it is. 25 straight for Paul Molitor. That's a new Brewer record. He got big hits, won a lot of games, had multi-hit games. It's about as impressive. I've seen a lot of great hitters in my day, but I'm telling you, that was something really special. Down the line. Every town and uh, every stadium we went to, I mean, the media was just there to talk to Paul, interview Paul, and uh, to watch him play that game that night. And uh, the way he handled it was unbelievable. On the ground, a deep throw. Not in time. He beat it out. Mowder has hit safely in 33 consecutive games. It was always nice to get it out of the way early in the game so you could go back to your primary focus, and that was trying to figure out a way to help the team win. But he takes care of it right there. From mid-July to late August, the hit parade rolled on, reaching 39 games, the seventh longest streak ever. The end finally came against Cleveland on August 26th with Molitor in the on-deck circle. As fate was ha would have it, the game was scoreless until the ninth inning. And, uh, you know, we're still somewhat in the pennant race, and it's late August, and Rick Manning gets the base hit up the middle, and Mike comes in to score, and, you know, I go up to make sure that he stands up. And it was weird. I mean, the streak was over, but we won the game, and yet the crowd didn't know quite how to react. And they are booing the fact that the Brewers have won the ball game. They boo. They booed poor Rick Manning because Paulie didn't get another shot. I'll never. Rick Manning was just stunned. Here he gets a base hit to center field to win the game, and they're booing. And Paul Molitor's streak dies. I think for the first time that I could remember, the, the crowd called me back out of the dugout for a post-game curtain call, and it was pretty emotional. On his road to the Hall of Fame, Molitor spent 15 years in Milwaukee. In 1978, he was the Sporting News Rookie of the Year. In 1992, he was the Brewers' MVP. In between, he was an All-Star five times, a record setter, and a fan favorite. Following the 92 season, Paul signed as a free agent with the Toronto Blue Jays. I was in Louisville, Kentucky. Sal Bano, my daughter, told me about 12.30 at night that Paul was gone. You know, I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. After 15 memorable years in Milwaukee, Paul Molitor opened the 1993 campaign as a Toronto Blue Jay. As he turned 37, his first season in Canada was one of his best. Fly ball, right field, Deers running hard, he won't get to it, and the Blue Jays win the game. You know, Joe Carter was another great teammate, had a great year, but Paul Molitor was hands down the MVP of that team. Mixing power and speed. Molitor hit 332 with 22 stolen bases and a career-high 22 home runs. In the World Series against Philadelphia, Joe Carter was the walk-off hero, but the MVP was Molitor. Here's the pitch to him. Line drive, left field, out of here. Home run, Paul Molitor. What you saw there was kind of quintessential Molitor. They tried to bust him inside. He'd yank it down the left field line. They'd try to pitch him away. He'd hit it the opposite way. And as always, his base running during that series was, was amazing. Molly hit an even 500 for the series and was running hard when Carter's ball went out. You know, Ricky Henderson was on second, and we were down by a run, and Joe hits this line drive out towards left field, and Incavillia was going back, and I'm hauling tail around second, thinking that, hey, if the ball hits the wall and I got a chance to score, we're going to win. Joe Carter with a three-run homer. Molitor scored in front of Carter, the decisive run to win the World Series. After so many years as a contender in Milwaukee, his championship wait was over. Paul Molitor, a world 
world champion for the first time. You know, I was elated. Don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, you play to win championships. I think the longer you play, the more you realize that. But it was a little strange to uh, enter the winner circle in that Blue Jay uniform. You know, I was really grateful for it. But there was, there was a little ironic twist of that, no doubt about it. With the Twins moving into the Dome, and, and who knows what their future might have in for them, and, and hopefully uh, with 10 years or, or more to go in my career, there's a, there's a good chance that I'll come back and play in the Twin City someday. In December of 1995, Paul Molitor finally came full circle, signing to play for the hometown Twins. My dad particularly was excited about the opportunity of being able to hop in the car and drive down to the ballpark and see me play just like the old American Legion day. Five years removed from a world championship of their own, the Twins went to spring training on the upswing, excited for the tandem of Molitor and Kirby Puckett. For the fans to be able to see those two guys hit back to back, I thought was going to be really special for the Twins fans and fans in the upper Midwest to really grab on to. I mean, I would have tuned in for that. I mean, that's a pretty special deal to see, quote unquote, two potential Hall of Famers hitting together in your hometown. Unfortunately, it never happened. Puckett's career ended in March, the victim of glaucoma. Amid the sorrow, the native son turned the 96 season into something special. As a visiting player, Molly had put on a show before. At the Metrodome in 91, he hit for the cycle. But now Minnesotans could savor the full impact of his game on a daily basis. Mahler's on third base. Ball gets away from the catcher, but it only rolls about two feet away from him. And he just kind of squirts to the catcher's left, just a little bit behind him. And Paul recognized instantly that the catcher was going to take a second or two to locate the ball. Paul scored standing up. To watch the ball roll away from the catcher just a few feet and him to score from third base was the most remarkable play I think I've ever seen. When Molitor came home, he was closing in on a milestone. Nearing his 40th birthday, he was 211 hits shy of 3,000. Everyone that got 3,000 hits is in the Hall of Fame, and I didn't think about 3,000 hits for a long time because of injuries. And as I got closer to it, you know, every once in a while that thought from the back of your mind creeps to the forefront about, you know, this, this has a chance to, uh, you know, land you a... Uh, uh, an induction seat someday. And he played and played and played, and I kept trying to take him out of the game to give him a break, and he said, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. But he was on a mission. And these kind of players, Hall of Fame players, they get on missions and they just, they go, they go. You can't stop them. You ain't gonna stop them. Paul Molitor's place in the Hall of Fame was secured in Kansas City on September 16th. To right center field. Myers and Nunley chase it. Myers, the ball drops. Molitor has his 3,000th hit. I'll tell you what my biggest moment in baseball is. Do you remember Paul's 3,000th hit? It was a double. But he stretched it to a triple because they loafed in the outfield. And you know how he went into third base? Head first slide. And he's in with a triple. He busted it out of the box. And he ends up sliding into third base on his face, getting his uniform dirty. And that, to me, is probably the best, the best symbol of his career, is that he got dirty getting his 3,000 hit. Paul Molitor becomes the 21st member of baseball's 3,000 hit club. To see him run and not settle for it, I got this hit. This is my 3,000 hit. How many other people would have done that? I don't think too many. In his race to Cooperstown, this one-of-a-kind player finished the 96 season with 225 hits and a batting average of 341. In September of 1998, Molitor got the last of 3,319 career hits. Five years later, the first ballot called him to the Hall of Fame. His was a baseball dream, born in St. Paul and nurtured with passion in the back alley on Grand Avenue and the playgrounds of Crocus Hill. From his roots to County Stadium to Toronto and back again, Paul Molitor played the game at the highest level and achieved a place where few men resign. Too much knowledge, too much instinct for the game, too much ability, too much work ethic, too much. He was up high. Played up high. Remarkable. I think that I was an entertaining player. 
I think I played the game hard. I think I played it wisely. I think I played it with passion. I think I respected my opponents and the umpires, my teammates, the fans. And uh, I realized that, you know, I was lucky to have a place in the game and not that the game was lucky to have me.